Good morning, Revive. Welcome to week three of Online Church. We're trucking along. Um, We just wanted to remind you that this week we do have an opportunity to be inviting some people to church. We have those egging kits that are available that you can take and hide some eggs in a neighbor or friend's yard and then leave a little note inviting them to Online Church for Easter. Um, This is a great opportunity. Sometimes people still aren't ready to make that commitment to jump into coming to church, but this is a unique year where they can try to check out our online service and see if that's a good fit for them. So if you want one of those egging kits, make sure to let us know and Miss Carrie or I will get one to you. We also wanted to remind you that our giving is still um, open and available online. And then if you are more of a check writer, you can still send those checks in the mail to the church. We do check the mail throughout the week. And um, we know that this is a hard time for everybody. We know everybody's job situations are different and circumstances are different, but we just challenge you um, during this time just to trust God, trust God that he's going to provide in unique ways um, as we continue to um, give back what he's given us. We're still continuing to push along in the community. We're still continuing to meet needs. And so we still um, need that support from everybody. So we just encourage you to um, take that challenge from God just to remember to give back what he's given to you. I think that's all that we have for you this week. So I'm going to hand it over to the worship team. Good morning. It is time to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So I invite you wherever you are to stand up, get the kids. We're going to worship. We're going to start with great things because we serve a great God and we have so many great things to celebrate this morning. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great. Just say hallelujah. I'm 
of worship, wherever that may be this morning. We just thank you, Lord, that when we call upon you, you will answer. In times like these, we need you. We need a Savior. And we are so grateful to be called your children and to have the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're starting a new series um, here at Revive called The Road to the Cross, getting us ready for Easter, which is crazy to say, but it's next week. So one thing to be prepared for is we're going to be sending out a Holy Week devotional to help guide you through the main events that happen this week. But today, we're going to kick off with the triumphal entry, um, Palm Sunday. Here we go. The Road to the Cross, The Road to Easter. I was thinking about my favorite songs that have the word road in it, okay? So 
Crossroads from John Mayer is one of my favorites. I know he didn't write that. Um, one Headlight talks a lot about driving on a road from the Wallflowers. Um, Jason Aldean, he's like the first guy to rap a song from a country standpoint called Dirt Road Anthem. And then I heard there was some band called like Backstreet Boys. I don't know, that probably didn't work out for them so well, but road seems to be in a lot of songs, a lot of our life. Uh, now think about roads that are significant to you, like important in your life. Um, a few years back when I was living in Grandview, Missouri, just for a little time, I would ride my road bike around just to kind of clear my head and focus on God. And it was hot the time of year that I was riding. And I'd always look forward to this one road that had the trees actually completely grown over from both sides. So it was just shade and it was downhill. And it was like the most perfect road. I always looked forward to that. But what about the road that your parents drove to the hospital or, or you drove to the hospital to deliver your kids or the road to your house growing up or just significant moments like the road to prom or the road to your school, the road to your church. When we drive down these things, we, we have these memories, right? Now, I grew up, many of you know, in Wichita, Kansas, and my parents still live in the house that my sister and I were raised in. And up until about 10 years ago, it was a dirt road. And it was like the last dirt road in the entire city. And I have so many memories of, of playing around on that dirt road. Like my sister and I, this isn't good, so kids, you might plug your ears. We would dig holes right by the mailbox to watch the mail truck bottom out. <laughs> Not cool, but it was something we did. One time I pulled my friends um, on my dirt bike. I put my sled like on a rope just behind me and I was pulling him down the street and I heard him screaming and I looked back and I realized that the friction between the sled and the sand had completely burned the bottom of the sled gone and my friend was about ready to just get a massive burn and he was screaming at me to stop. I remember that. I, I remember going out and washing my car and getting it all ready for like a great date and then coming back to my parents house or my house at the time and I would be going like two miles per hour to avoid anything getting on this car. And then somebody always was coming from the other direction, going like 30 miles per hour, and it was all worth nothing. But roads can be significant to us. Um, during this series, we're going to look at the most important road of all, the one that Jesus walked on his way to the cross, the one that he took on the way to torture, but with a purpose. Our prayer is that this series has the power to, but if you allow it, that this series will actually change the road that you're on. See, one of the things that happens is we all have a desired destination. So follow me on this one. For most of us, it's the same exact stuff, like across the board, even like Christians and non-Christians. Like everyone wants a happy life, I would imagine. Everyone who's married wants a happy marriage. Just kids, Right? Or when you're a kid, you want happy parents. When you're parents, you want happy kids. You want a good job and on and on. And hopefully your final destination is heaven ultimately. But the problem is, is that we get sidetracked. We get stuck in a ditch. And looking at our current situation right now with all this quarantine and fear of COVID-19 and all that's going on and everything shutting down and like not exactly sure of what to do, it can feel like a ditch on our way to our final destination. And so the big question that we're going to start off with today is this. What do you do when you run into tragedy, trials, and even old addictions? Here's some good news. Jesus walked a crazy road the last seven days up to the cross, and he modeled exactly how to do it well. In this just seven days, it was packed full of Jesus experiencing betrayal, loneliness, tragedy, and on and on. And then for us, we're going to celebrate this next Sunday on Easter. We celebrate, after all of that, life. And so our destination is, in Christ, we are offered life. So today we're going to be in Matthew 21. So if you have your Bibles, open them up. We'll have it here on the screen. And we're going to call this one, The Distraction of the Crowd and Applause. I don't know exactly your situation, but I do understand the human condition that we all like applause. I mean, it's intoxicating when somebody says, hey, I see what you did there. Or really, I mean, even a standing ovation is like really what everybody wants, even if you're shy. I mean, somebody to say, hey, I know what you did, and that is awesome. It's intoxicating. But the problem is that applause can be deceiving when it comes from the wrong people. Jesus dealt with this a lot. 
we can relate to Christ in this area. He had his entire life people telling him exactly who he was, who he should be. Here, I'll prove it to you. I mean, constantly just people telling him, Jesus, take the magic show on the road. I mean, he was doing miracles and people would be in his ear. Jesus, I mean, you're able to heal people's sicknesses. Just take that on the road. I mean, be all about that. You're going to get so much attention. Jesus, you should run for office. I mean, you would be an unbelievable political figure. You would be a military, like, genius of how to strategically go about winning battles. I mean, Jesus, you've got to focus in on politics and military advance. I mean, people constantly and on and on weighing in on the big questions of life that we all ask. Who am I and what am I here to accomplish? I mean, can you imagine that Jesus had that more than you did? Because the public scene started really focusing in on him and what he was doing. Jesus was both fully human, fully human, and fully God at the same time. And so if that's true, I imagine that Jesus struggled at some point with some temptation in that area of like, well, what do I do here? Do I play into the applause of the crowd? But he continues to make the right decision. I, I want to put a quote up here um, from a, a poet named E.E. E. Cummings. Here, here it is. It's kind of tricky, so follow it. You might have to back it up and read it again. It says, To be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight. I love that. You and I, we have so many voices telling us what to do. <laughs> Let's just see how Jesus deals with it. So, Matthew 21. Usually, I read out of the NIV, New International Version, but today, we're going to be in the NLT, New Living Translation. It just reads a little smoother for our purposes today. So Matthew 21, starting in verse 1, we're just going to chop this up. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Verse 2, "'Go into the village over there,' he says." As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you what you're doing, just say the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. See, as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he is all business. He just came from raising Lazarus from the dead, which was an unbelievable victory but was getting him both positive and negative attention. And he goes to a familiar place and looks down in the valley and then heads that way. But before he does, he sends his disciples in to get this donkey. He tells them to go get it. What's crazy is somehow the owner of the donkey knew that this was going to happen. And when they says it's for the Lord, they quickly said, or he said, absolutely, you got it. I mean, this is so cool. I mean, it only works with Jesus, right? If I told you, go to the car lot that may or may not be open <laughs> right now, I'm not sure, and tell them that you need the red car, the convertible, okay, and Alex sent you, and they should just say, good to go, here, here it is. It, it won't work, right? I mean, it only works with Jesus because he is prophetic, and it's incredible, he knows exactly how it all works. Let's continue this. Matthew 21, 6 says, The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. Verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and then threw their garments over the colt and sat on it. This is, like I said, a fulfillment of prophecy. See, several hundred years before this, there was a prophet named Zechariah that said this was going to happen. He told the people of Jerusalem, that their king would be riding in on a donkey. And it wasn't just Zechariah who said this. It was also a fulfillment of prophecy from Deuteronomy, the prophet Isaiah, and it was even written about in the Psalms. And Jesus is nailing every single bit of it. Let's continue on in this story. Matthew 21, 8 says, Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. This is quite a celebratory scene. Jesus was in the center of the procession. I mean, this was a show, and the people all him, all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. I mean, can you just imagine this scene? 
Jesus on a donkey coming through this crazy loud procession of everybody shouting at him that he is the Messiah. He's to receive the highest praise. You know, you might think of Jesus coming in on something a lot more elaborate than a donkey, like a white horse or just coming in on the shoulders of his followers or something. I mean, he's coming in on something that's not even seen as important, but it's so symbolic and it's prophetic. See, Solomon, way back known as the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, hundreds of years before, he rode a donkey coming in as the reigning king of the Jews. And so Jesus is showing, this is who I am, the king of the Jews. People waved palm branches as he passed by as a way to honor the Lord. See, this is prophetic and it's symbolic. It helps us understand. They're shouting, salvation has come through this Jesus, the Messiah. And the Messiah means he is the chosen one, the ones that the, the one that Jesus or the Jews have been waiting for for hundreds of years. I mean, this was a big moment. They're referring to him as Savior, which simply means the one who saves, right? But they were off a bit, and we'll talk about that. They were thinking about the Roman rule and the oppression that they were experiencing. So here's where our message kind of comes to a halt. Maybe you've read that triumphal entry before, but I want to help draw this to more of a personal level. Here's what I want to actually focus in on today. We're going to jump over to Luke. We've been in Matthew. This is a parallel passage, which means same story, just from a different view, different perspective. In Luke 19.41, it says, But as he came closer to Jerusalem, so this is the same scene, and he saw the city ahead. He saw it down from the Mount of Olives, okay? He began to weep. Now, why did Jesus weep? It wasn't because of fear of the pain that was coming on the cross. That's not why he wept here. He wept because he knew the people didn't get it. That it was all just going to be a bunch of lip service. See, the applause... It only lasts for a little while. Jesus knew that this applause was going to change. From praise, the highest praise goes to you, Jesus, the one who is Savior and Messiah, that just a week later, that same crowd, many exact same people, were going to say, crucify him and give him up and hand him over. Jesus knew that. And he was living by a steadfast principle that we need to grasp today. And here it is. The one thing I want you to grab, it's this. Live for the audience of one. Seems simple, right? But it's so incredibly deep. Live for the audience of one. And maybe as you're sitting in isolation or quarantine, you're like, well, Alex, I'm, I'm forced to. Nope, that's not what I'm talking about. Live for the audience of one, and you're not that one. Live to please God the Father, God Almighty. Despite the noise, Jesus was focused in on the voice of the Father. He spent time with God, so he knew how to identify God's voice in his life. We must do the same with all the noise, all the distraction. We must know when God is speaking to us. I want to end with Psalms 91. I believe in this really crazy time that we're in. There is some opportunity in it, but I also see Satan taking ground and fear ruling a lot of people's lives. And we need to combat that fear with Scripture. That's what Jesus did. And so we have to build our arsenal, okay? We have to get ready for battle. And here's one that I want to hand you today. Psalms 91. Let me read it, and then we'll break it down. This is so fulfilling and nutritional for our souls. I mean, if you really grab this, you will be more whole after you hear it. That's how awesome scripture is. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Man, that's some good words. See, Psalms are like words for our soul. Verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Guys, as I've been thinking through this message and preparing it, and living in the world with you. I'm up against some trials and some issues and praying for many of you, and we're working through this together. I mean, we've never seen this happen in our world. 
I mean, it doesn't take long for you to run in to fear-based stuff, right? I mean, you turn on TV, you turn on Facebook, you open your phone. I mean, you talk to your neighbor. It's going to come out, and it's going to be an anxious type of conversation. I mean, it's just the nature of it. I remember a few years ago, I was watching a preacher, and he was just talking about the Lord's report. The Lord's report, as if it's like news to be given out to any of his followers. And he was challenging anybody who listened. He says, are you believing the Lord's report, or are you believing the world's report? Now, I have a prayer for myself, and I would imagine this is true for you, that I want to live in reality, but I want to stay positive and focused on my God. And so the only way that I can do that is ground myself in Psalm 91. It talks about having refuge in God, having shelter. And that is such a beautiful thought. I'm not saying avoid what's going on in the world. We need to be wise. But you shouldn't listen to it. You shouldn't engage in it until you've heard the Lord's report. This word refuge, I want to finish with this and then I'll pray. This word refuge, when you look it up, One definition is the condition of safety. It's like a condition that we would have or catch. A condition of safety that we believe the Lord's report over all else. See, God is good. Jesus modeled for us how to live for the audience of one, how to hear the Father's voice above all of the noise and the applause and the lip service that was being offered to him. I mean, it was a mess, but Jesus was able to hone in on God, and you can as well. Take shelter. Have a condition of safety in our almighty God through Christ because he loves you. Let's pray. God, I just pray that today we would take shelter. We would be found in the shadow of the most high God. Having refuge, understanding that you are our fortress. You are to protect us, God. Not only from physical ailments, which we may or may not be able to avoid, God, but spiritual ones that come against us. We claim it in the name of Jesus, and we say, stay away, enemy, from my mind, from my heart, from my family, from our church, that we would stay steadfast, focused on Christ. I pray today that we would all take one step closer to him. In the name and power of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Hi, everybody. We're the Techmeyer family, and hopefully you're having a great week. Um, We are, but even though we're not together as a church body, we can still respond to today's message. But we trust God in everything that we do. We can also trust Him in our finances as well. To do this, we encourage you to give on GoRevivedChurch.com, or you can go ahead and give on our app. Also... We don't have a prayer web that we can all speak to in our, into our houses. However, we do have phones and computers. So if you're part of a Facebook group or a huddle group, or you just have friends that are also believers, don't hesitate, reach out to them for prayer. You can say, hey, I have this prayer request that I need, but I can also pray for you for something. So that way everyone can be praying for somebody. Also, we have communion. Now here at Techmar Household, we do white bread and coffee, but it may be different for you. Maybe you do pumpernickel bread and orange juice. I don't know. It's up to you. So what really matters is that the bread represents the broken body of Christ. The juice represents the blood that was shed for us in sacrifice. It represents God sending his son and dying for us. And so when you do it, however you do it, just remember that we're doing it to remember what God did for us. So hopefully you're having a great week like we are. We're just in love with spending time with each other and tickling each other and just having a lot of fun. Hopefully you guys are doing the same. We can't wait to see you again from us at the Techmire household. Bye. Bye.